Father, I just pray that you would enlighten us by your word. Anytime we open your word and we study your word, you do, th- you do stuff inside of us, deep within our hearts. You settle our minds and our spirits. You set us on a firm foundation. You bring hope and light and life and power. And so I pray the word of God have its full effect in our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. I was born and raised in St. John, New Brunswick in Eastern Canada, and I grew up in classrooms that were decorated by pictures of the young queen in her glittering crown and all of the trappings. Queen Elizabeth II, almost every classroom I walked into or school office, and I was in the office almost as often as I was in the classroom. This one was in the office. In the classroom, we had one with the queen and kind of a a silver satiny thing with a a sash across the front and a big badge here. But everywhere you went, we had the picture of the queen that was probably at that point in time at least 15 years old, the picture. But as a little boy, I remember growing up thinking she was the most beautiful, beautiful woman in all of the world and all of the jewels. And it was pretty amazing stuff. And I heard somebody just laugh at me over here. No accounting for taste, is there? (laughs) Obviously, I don't have any. When at uh, 25, Elizabeth was suddenly made queen of England at the untimely death of her father, Stalin was still the general secretary of the USSR, and Harry Truman was the president of the United States, and Winston Churchill was the prime minister of England. That was another world, wasn't it? Another world yet in my time. Elizabeth is the longest reigning monarch now in the earth. 67 years of her reign have been recorded. She's 93 years of age and has not shown any signs of stepping down from the throne. Elizabeth was in Africa on a world tour of the Commonwealth when the news reached her of her father's passing terrible Shocking, shattering news, to be sure, but overshadowed completely by the fact that she was in that moment, in a moment she became the queen of an empire so vast, the sun never set on her shores. 25. Now, I don't suppose it's within us to really feel sorry for a queen or a king or someone who lives in royalty. Yet I can't imagine what it must have been like for a 25-year-old child of privilege to suddenly awaken to this truth. Nothing was ever going to be the same again. Her marriage would not be the same again. Her relationship with her children would not be the same again. Her life, in essence, from that moment onward would never really be her own. From Elizabeth and the awe and wonder of that moment, I pivot to Mary, another woman whose life took a turn of dynamic proportion. I'm not talking about Queen Mary, the grandmother of Elizabeth. I'm talking, I'm talking about a Mary who would never set foot inside a palace. Oh, she, was, she was royal in a sense in that she was of the bloodline of King David, but she was also a Nazarene peasant girl. Yet her life contribution would usher in a kingdom so marvelous, so mighty, and eternal, all kings ultimately must bow before that kingdom. The Princess Elizabeth's great disruption found her in Kenya when she was 25 years old. The peasant Mary's great disruption found her in the town of Nazareth when she was 13 or 14 years old. 13, any 13 or 14 year olds over there? Would one of them just wave a hand? I won't call you out, but I just want to know there's someone. Oh, thank you. Thank you. One bold soul at the back of the section over here. 13 or 14 years of age. Luke chapter 1, picking up really from where we were last week, at verse 26. In the sixth month, 
the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And it came to her, and, and he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at this saying, trying to discerning what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you'll conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He'll be great and be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has already conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Don't miss this next part. Let it be to me according to your word. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Regarding Mary, I've organized the message around three words this morning. The last two will speak to us quite directly. The first should at least give us pause. Story of Mary in three words. The first word is <laughs> young. Young. Very young. She was shockingly young by modern standards. 13 or 14 years of age. Now, her betrothal to Joseph at this age would have been nothing out of the ordinary. Joseph most probably was 18 or 19 it's usually the way it worked within the culture. In ancient Middle East, the groom was always older. At the betrothal, the woman became, in that moment of betrothal, legally married. Although she still remained in her father's house, it could be a matter of weeks, months, or even years. She stayed in her father's house for some time. She couldn't belong to another man unless she was divorced from her betrothed. So the moment they were betrothed, they were legally married in the eyes of the law of the Jews. The wedding only meant that the betrothed woman, accompanied by then a very colorful procession, was brought from her father's house to the house of her groom. That legal tie with him was then consummated, and that's the wedding part of it. But it's all one process. But Mary would have been, she would have been expecting to live in her father's house for a period of time when this angelic, when this angelic vision comes. So the young woman we encounter in the Christmas story is very young. She hasn't lived in intimacy with her husband, though she is bound to him and him to her. She is 13 or 14. Can you get your head around that? She is 13 or 14. I think I'm a bit blinded by our own culture and by my own experience, but I have to tell you, I can still remember, I can still remember 13 and 14 with some clarity. Not everything has slipped away. I remember what it was like about seventh, eighth grade. I have to, I have to tell you, I, I remember 13, 14, and I was a bit goofy. It was said of me by many that I had never had a serious thought. And they had data to support that presupposition. And so I'm just a little bit overwhelmed when I think of a girl at 13 or 14 suddenly faced with the gravity and the immensity of this angelic visit. 
And I wonder even more when I step back from it a little bit, I wonder even more, not so much about the customs of the Jews at 13, 14, 16, 18, at those ages. I, I wonder when I look at the extended adolescence that marks our days. Remember when adolescence was basically from about 12 to 17 or 13 to 18, remember? According to MedPage today, adolescence begins now, in, according to the people who do the generational studies, adolescence, they count it beginning today around age 10. It extends until 24. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Many educators and psychologists argue that that number really should be 26 or 28. What used to be a four or a five year window of adolescence, which was the bridge from childhood to adulthood, the bridge has now been lengthened to cover about 15 years. It's a lot of time. This was all front and center last year when a New York couple, it was in the papers, a New York couple had to go to court to evict their 30 year old son from their basement. Remember that story? Didn't have a job, was living at home, wasn't going to leave. They tried to move him out several times, wouldn't do it, wouldn't pay child support to the child that he had fathered, and they just basically living on mom and dad. They said, we've had enough. They went to evict him, and it ended up in court. What a sad story. That's the case of Michael Rotondo. It's still rattling around in the courts because he's appealed, he's appealed, and now he is appealing his case to the Supreme Court can't make this stuff up. Do you imagine the Supremes are going to take any time with the case of a 30-year-old being evicted from his mom's house? They might. I don't know. All of the generational research is telling us the same thing, and I say this without passing judgment on the generation that's coming up, because those of us, all of you boomers out there, you just wave your hand, you're a boomer or you're an Xer. Good to see you all this morning. We created the environment that they're growing up in. So often what happens is we look at them and say, oh, those millennials, oh, those iGeners, oh, that generation that's coming up, they're this, this, and this, and this. Well, look in the mirror, son. Look in the mirror, sister. We created the culture that shaped them. Nobody really wants to grapple with that, so I'll just leave it there. But the bridge to adulthood has been extended now well beyond the river. We're flying above trees. Therefore, it's difficult for us to imagine a 13 or 14-year-old girl emotionally capable of handling an angelic visit like this that turned her life on end. I can take you to place after place after place in the Scripture where God used the old, sometimes the prohibitively old, to do His will. Moses at 80 going back to Egypt and dealing with Pharaoh. I think of Abraham and Sarah and Elizabeth and Zechariah. And of course, the wisdom of eldership is there for us from Genesis to Revelation. You can't miss it. You trip over it walking through the scripture. Just the the wisdom of, of eldership, and it is so necessary, so necessary. But God also uses the young, the young Samuel. David, Joseph, Daniel, Josiah. And in their ranks, you have to include, you have to include Mary. Mike Rutherford, Mike and the Mechanics, The Living Years, great opening line of the song, Every Generation blames the one before. And it seems to me that every generation is cynical about the generation to come. Cynical. I don't know how many of you might admit to it, but it's easy to tap into the cynicism of the age, to look at the younger people who are coming up and saying, I don't know what those people are thinking. Those people aren't thinking at all. We hear a lot of stuff come out of our mouths that our parents used to say about us. How many of you, your parents just loved your music? 
They said, son, I don't know who that is, but I hope you just play it a little bit more. Man, I, I had a dad who used to go in and raid my records. You know, you're not listening to that. You're not listening to that. Oh. Bread. How many of you remember bread? I saw your dying lying neath a tree in front of oh. My dad threw that one out because he saw a song title, I Want to Make It With You. That was it. That one's out. It was like, pooh. And... Every generation becomes cynical about the generation to come. We do. God help us. We do. It's wrong, but we do. My parents' builder generation, they were up in arms about us radical boomers who then transmutated into yuppies who produced Xers. But we were suspicious of them, those latchkey, those latchkey kids who then, they somehow were mutated into helicopter parents who loomed over their millennials and now millennials are having babies. And we look down through the generations and we look at the generation to come and unless we guard our hearts, we're cynical. We have this idea that God can only use us or an older generation or the eldership. We need to understand that God wants to use the youngest among us. That God wants to you. he wants to move, he wants to deal with people at a very tender age. We shouldn't discount them. I was expecting an amen this morning. If I don't get one soon, I'm quitting. I'm just done. We need to understand that the generation that is coming up is not to be disdained. It is not to be discounted. It's to be embraced. We need to understand that they are not the church of tomorrow. They are the church of today. And God, by his spirit, will speak through them. And he will speak to us. And if we don't believe it, then what are we playing at? It is so easy to be infected by the spirit of the age, and the spirit of the age is cynicism. We better believe in them. We better believe in iGen, poor dears. Who else is going to believe in them in this cynical world? The church should always be first among encouragers and the last among cynics. And I find sometimes that is reversed. Our hopes, you see, go far beyond human potentials and cultural disruptions. We've got to tune out the noise and adopt a little bit of hope because the same God who called us, the same God who called Abraham, the same God who called David, the same God who called every great you can find in the Scripture and every great that has come down through the centuries, the same God that called them will call the young ones. He uses the young and pity the church who's indifferent to the young today. Their churches will be closing their doors within 15 years. Mary was young. Young. How else will we describe her? Secondly, Mary, this word that, that comes to mind is surrender. When I think of Mary, I think of surrender. The angel's greeting was confusing. The plan that was outlined was unprecedented. The immediate days ahead for her would be very, very difficult. Who would believe her? I can see her negotiating with God. Okay, I'll do this, but Joseph and I have to be relocated to Beersheba. We are not staying here with the Nazarenes. No way. They're brutal. My aunts alone. I can't deal with that. So God, move us to another place. Not a word, no conditions offered from Mary. She simply says, be it unto me according to your word. How deep was her understanding of the coming of Messiah? What did she know? How much did she know? I think these questions stirred in Mark Lowry's heart when he wrote the lyrics to the, the song that's sung a lot at Christmas, Mary, Did You Know? I love that song. Captures me every time. A lot of people don't like it. They, don't, they I, I don't know. Every, every Christmas season, it is pilloried, criticized, even mocked on the blogosphere. And if you don't know what the blogosphere is, you need a millennial in your life. But every Christmas, people take to writing and the Twitterati go after it. Those are people who use Twitter, also known as Tweeple. 
But they light up the internet and they troll Mark Lowry over this song, Mary, Did You Know? I've had a few pastor friends and academics. I've got an academic friend who just was brutal, just brutal on this song. And I want to just step back a little and say all Mark Lowry does in the song is he asks questions. Mary, did you know? Did you know? Did you know? We supply the answers. We can look brilliant. But he's just asking questions. And I always understood that the best way to learn anything was through question and answer. So I'm a fan of Mark Lowry, and I love the song. One blogger called it the most scripturally illiterate song ever written, to which I wanted to question the scriptural literacy of the blogger. These people are nuts out there. Simply because they write something, we immediately vest them with authority by clicking and reading it. And because it's on the internet, it must be true. Surely I jest. Kind of. What did Mary know? Well, her knowledge didn't come to her all immediately, but when you look at the aggregate, all of the things that were told to her between the announcement that a child would be conceived and the presentation of Jesus in the temple... Well, she knew what she had heard from Gabriel at the Annunciation that we just read a moment ago. She knew that much, and there was some, there was some stupendous stuff in there. She also knew what the angel told Joseph in his dream, for surely he had informed her what the angel said, he will save the people from their sins. What Elizabeth told Mary by the Holy Spirit at their visitation together, remember that? That's in Luke chapter 1, earlier, 39 through 56. There was a lot of information there. And then what Gabriel told Zechariah about his son John pointing to Jesus, they had all of that. That's Luke 2, 8 through 20. What Simeon and Anna, the prophet and the prophetess, told Mary at the presentation in the temple, again in the second chapter of Luke, she knew a lot. Now, this is what people shoot at. Did she know that Jesus would walk on water? Well, no. It's po- Surely we've got a little bit of room for poetic license in a song, for pity's sake. It's not a doctrinal statement, it's a song. Don't send me mail. Just a song. Did she know he'd heal old blind men? No. Did she know he would give, uh, calm the storm? No. But she knew enough. And she knew her own soul, she knew her own heart and mind. She knew enough to lay down all of her dreams as a sacrifice as a 13 or 14-year-old girl and say, be it unto me according to your word. That's surrender. You see, true greatness in God's eyes is not measured by the height of your achievement. It's measured by the depth of your surrender. You will never achieve for God at any height unless you have first surrendered at great depth. And the depth of your surrender will ultimately affect everything else in your life. Elizabeth would have never been queen unless she said, I will do my, what she understood to be, duty. For Mary, we'll see, it wasn't duty to her, it became her joy. But she surrendered herself fully. Achievement, achievement is not the measure. Surrender is. And it indicates everything else that happens in life. Surrender, what we give. You see, our bodies will go to dust and our achievements will all soon be forgotten. But those precious moments of surrender before God is when the power of the Spirit moves through us to accomplish His eternal will in a temporal world. Winston Churchill said, we make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. There is nowhere in the world where they erect a statue in memoriam of somebody who took There's not a statue to a thief anywhere in the world. They build statues to people who gave. Sacrifice is what puts you on that pedestal. Not taking, but giving. 
Interesting, isn't it, that this Christmas season now, well, we're 2,000 years removed from the events. But in your household, you will set out on a coffee table someplace. Some of you have the collectible items and everything else, but the Christmas creche. And then some, some churches will have their nativity scenes outside on the, the front lawn. And some towns and cities will still dare to put them out. And all over the United States and even around the world, a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand, how many, how many Christmas nativity scenes will be set up and who will be, who will be at the center of it all besides the baby, who will it be and every one of them, Mary. Every one of them memorializes what she gave. So when we look to Mary, we see her youth, we see her surrender. But we also need to see her praise. I could shape this point by praising Mary for so many things, but I would miss the point altogether. I want to point out not that Mary's worthy of any kind of praise. I want to point out that Mary responded to the task that was placed before her with praise. With praise. Not grudgingly. This colossal intrusion, this absolute disruption in her life resulted in a total surrender and in that surrender, an offering of praise. Doesn't it sound biblical? Doesn't the Bible tell us that we're to give thanks in all things? Don't we praise the Lord at all times? Is he not? I'm not sure. Maybe it's just me, but it seems to me when I read the scripture, I am taught that he is worthy to be praised at all times, in all things, in all circumstances, that when I praise him, there is a release of his power. But what do we do when circumstances don't line up with our expectations? Praise? Praise? My great-grandfather was a simple country preacher, came to faith late in life, became pretty radicalized, believed what the scripture said about praising God in all things, and went down to the river near eastern Maine where another fellowship was baptizing new converts. Somehow, they'd got some things kind of mixed up in the scriptures, and they dunked, they dunked people seven times. Anyone ever been to a 7X baptism where you went and they just kept putting you? Somehow they got Naaman and baptism mixed up. And my grandfather went to attend. And he stood on the banks of the river. And every time they went down, he shouted hallelujah. And one of my grandfather's lay deacons really got upset with him. And he said, what are you doing? He said, I'm thanking God we don't have to do it that way. You know, you can always find a reason for praise. And Mary said, verse 46 in Luke 1, this is her song. It's a song. Because uh, the Catholics, of course, have given us a lot of the phrases that have ended up in our Bible. This is the Magnificat. Magnificat is simply uh, speaks of magnify. Because Mary says in the first line, my soul magnifies the Lord, which is why it's called the Magnificat. But this song, my soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. How much did Mary know? All generations will call me blessed. Have you ever walked around in your life feeling like, I just don't know why these things have happened to me. I must be cursed. If Mary all of a sudden was looking at her life saying, I had a plan for my life, Joseph and I had a future that was all laid out, and then this angel appeared and laid before me this bizarre mission. She could have gone negative, but what does she say? I will be remembered as one who is blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. Holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. 
And she just gets caught up in praising God. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those in humble estate. He's filled the hungry with good things and the rich sent away empty. He's helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his offspring forever. 13 or 14 years old and she's exploding in praise before God as she is presented with a daunting challenge. Be it unto me according to your word. It strikes me that Moses put up far more resistance at the burning bush than did Mary when the angel Gabriel appeared. Remember Moses at the bush? The bush is burning, it's not consumed. A voice comes out of the bush, take off your sandals, you're standing on holy ground. That's pretty fearful. He does that, God tells him what he's going to do. And what does Moses do? He starts ticking off all of the reasons why you got the wrong guy. I am not the guy. I don't speak good, I don't have any confidence. I'm... He had a long list. The Lord had to continue just to say, you're my guy, you're my guy, here's what I'm going to do for you, you're my guy, you're my guy. Not just Moses, Gideon. Gideon said, you got to prove to me who you are, so we're going to do this thing with the fleece. You need to, I want the fleece dry and the ground wet, and then I want the fleece wet and the ground dry, but you've got to show me, you got to really show me who you are. That's, That's Gideon, one of the great heroes of the Old Testament. How does Mary respond? My soul magnifies the Lord. No qualifications, no reservations, no hesitations. Just, okay, Lord. Where others who rose to greatness in their time had to grow up into their callings, this girl, this child sings, he who is mighty has done great things for me. So in my study this week, I kept hearing in the back of my mind over and over again, what child is this? And I'm not talking about the carol that speaks of Jesus in the, in the manger. I speak of his mother. What child is this? Mary, a mere child whose faith astounds me. What glory is there in the simplicity of her faith? You say, well, if an angel appeared to me and said something like that, I'd be okay. Mary didn't have a Bible. You do. You want to know what God has said? You've got enough reading to keep you going all year long and only touch the surface of it. You have the word of God, the revelation of God to us. And the presence, the presence of the Spirit now in a way that they did not know back then on a broad scale. You have all of this. Her simplicity of faith astounds me. So I'm I'm afraid that the longer we live, the more our life experience affects our faith. It diminishes it from the ideal that Jesus revealed. You see, Jesus said that if you're going to come to me, you've got to come like a child. We call it childlike faith, not childish faith. Childlike faith faith. Mary's faith was childlike. May we in our advancing years sustain a childlike faith. That kind of faith makes surrender liberating. Liberating. Teaching my girls to swim. I taught two of them to swim. One, doesn't matter what it is in life, she decided I'll do it myself. I'll teach myself. Thank you very much. I'm over it, I'm not bitter. And she did learn to swim well on her own. But with two of them, I remember that moment at a swimming pool. You dads and moms know it, where you're standing about 18 inches off the, off the edge of the pool. You're in the water, and you're doing this. And that little one, you're saying, What? Jump and I will catch you. Remember that moment? I see some of you smiling. Some of you have got this on film. Jump and I will catch you. That child must in that moment exhibit childlike 
faith. Where their confidence is, when I jump, no matter what happens, I know I'm safe. And so with a lot of starting and stopping and coaxing, my problem has always been patience. And so I'm, I'm standing there going, okay, I'm getting, I'm tired of, it was like five minutes. And I'm about worn out with this. Okay, kid, you're going to jump or I'm, I'm going to throw you in. But you're going to, I didn't, I didn't do that. That's child abuse. I wouldn't do that. But I'm, for, I'm grateful there's no record that's kept of any of these things. But that moment when Ashley jumped, landed splat on my chest and in my arms, is followed by a release of pure joy as she laughs and her face lights up. You see, faith, faith brings liberation and joy when we step into it. When we trust him, he's a better father than I could ever be. That kind of faith that Mary had was just like that, faith that makes surrender liberating, faith that makes praise spontaneous. That kind of faith made a peasant girl the very first to witness Jesus First, she saw his first steps. You say, why is that important to you, Pastor? Because I've been following in his steps for all of my days. Mary saw his first steps. His first steps. Sherry and I are captivated by the Netflix series, The Crown. Have to just admit, it's a problem. It's a problem. How many of you have got to the end of an episode and saying, what do you think? You want to watch another one? Click, and you're already into it. Binge, binge watching. We're, going to, we're, we're actually going to counseling. Um, but love the crown. First two seasons absolutely blew me away, partly because I grew up in Canada. I was very interested, but the, the series is, is fabulous. The photography and the cinematography is, is breathtaking and it, it is so well written. Television is often so bad. And yet this, not historically 100% accurate, but the telling of her story is, I started with her, so I'll end there. Her story is pretty fascinating. And so we've been really kind of caught up in it. In season three, which we just saw the, the, all of season three, and I know I'm giving away a little bit to those of you who haven't seen it yet, I already had somebody come after me after first service saying, you blew it for me. In season three, Prince Philip's mother comes into the drama. Philip, the husband of, of uh, Elizabeth. He'd been estranged from his mother most of his adult life because when he was a boy, uh, his mother, not able to cope with trauma in life, had ended up in an asylum. Family was split up, blown all over the place. They were part of European royalty, so they were farmed out everywhere. But he had had no relationship with his mother, who after finding release from mental institutions, eventually became a Greek Orthodox nun, serving the poor in, in Greece. He had nothing to do with her, considered her to be nuts. Anyways, in 1967, there was a coup in Greece, and word reached the palace that things were exceedingly dangerous. They dispatched a plane, some emissaries, to go and get Prince Philip's mother out of Greece. They found her there, put her on a plane, and brought her back to Buckingham Palace. They put her in a room next to Prince Suzanne, and place they thought they would kind of keep an eye on her. Another one of the loose screws in the royal toolbox. She was an heiress related to most of the royal families of Europe. Her great-grandmother great 
I believe was Queen Victoria and great, uh, a great grandfather or great great grandfather was the Tsar of Russia. I mean, she was connected, this woman. A first class eccentric, congenital deafness had put her at a deficit from the very beginning of her life. And so she'd lived a hard life dedicated to the poor and this 82 year old princess who's been estranged from her family for most of her adult life is suddenly brought into Buckingham Palace where she confounds the stuffy royals all around her with her absolute simplicity, sincerity. Prince Philip is finally shamed into going and seeing his mother. Imagine such a thing. Sometime after she'd been there, he goes up a few floors to her room. When he pushes the door open, she's praying. She turns her head and sees that it's him and stands. It's one of the most poignant moments when they share this moment, this conversation. He apologizes. I owe you an apology, he says. She turns it all around and says, if anyone here is owed an apology, it's you. I wasn't there for you. It really is beautifully done. It's a wonderful moment. I wish families all over the reach of this church could have that kind of reconciliation in this season. But when she is asked about him and how he is, she asks in, in a moment, it's just, she said, you talked about being faithless to me. She said, let me ask you, how is your faith? How is your faith? He responds to her, dormant. Dormant. She looks at him as only a mother can and says, you must, you must find faith. It'll help you. Then she catches herself and she looks beyond him. In that moment, you know what it's like when someone's looking at you, but they're seeing something far and far beyond. She said, it will, it'll help you. But then there's that moment and she realizes the inadequacy of what she has said. And she looks out at the middle distance and says, no, 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 no. It doesn't just help. It's everything. It's everything. So I'm asking you today, how is your faith? Does it look anything like the faith of a 13-year-old, 14-year-old girl named Mary? Is it a faith that is marked by surrender? Is it a faith that's marked by praise? Is it somewhat of an, a bitter faith? If you kind of closed in, pulled up all of your bridges or your drawbridges, your, your defenses are up? Or is it a simple faith that says, he holds me in the palm of my hand and as he leads me, blessing will follow me. Where is your faith today? I speak to everyone and anyone who's looking to the future with fear, regret, or looking to the past with regret. Stand out in the sunlight of promise, forgetting whatever the past held of sorrow and wrong. We waste half our strength in a useless regretting. We sit by old tombs in the dark far too long. It's time for some of you to get out of the graveyard and start living by faith. Time for you to abandon your fears and start living by faith. How is your faith? How's your faith? Would you bow your heads with me for a moment? Lord, as convincing as I try to be, only you can speak to the heart of a man or a woman. Only you can convince us of our need of you. And I pray, Lord, the deep would call out to deep. I pray, Lord, that brokenness would be met suddenly by that flicker of flame that could it be hope that rises up within us whenever we look to you, O oh Lord. I pray that faith would arise in hearts this morning. 
with heads bowed and eyes closed, is there anyone in the house today who would say, I would have to say that my faith is dormant today? Dormant. I'm not going to call you out or embarrass you, but there's something about just saying, God, that's me. If that's you, just slip your hand up to God and say, here I am, Lord, you know. 